Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast about board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. Hey, and this is Anthony. And this is episode 324, the 15th annual Gordon Geek Awards. We like to thank all of our Patreon backers for helping us bring you a brand new episode. All right, everyone, we are back and we are talking about the 15th annual Golden Geek Award winners. So uh, if you're not too familiar with Board Game Geek, it's kind of weird that you're listening to us, but we still appreciate it. But Board Game <laughs> yeah, right. Geek is one of those kind of websites that is like main industry uh, board gaming. In fact, and it's, it would be incredibly, insanely uh, you know, mysterious that you would not know about Board Game Geek. Because every once in a while I meet a gamer and they don't even know of like, oh, you could buy board games online that's not Amazon? And I'm like, yes? So it's perfectly possible you don't know about Board Game Geek, but Board Game Geek is the largest depository online of board games. And every year they do an awards. And these are the best of the best. So we'll be talking about that on our feature review. Anthony, you know Board Game Geek, right? <laughs> <laughs> nope no idea what you're talking about nope see there, see there's there's one every minute and anthony happens to be the one so this yep. will all no. be new to him <laughs> i every every month you're like do the board game geek hotness and i'm like i don't know what that is but i'll talk about 15 <laughs> games at random <laughs> yeah yeah it's that thing about when it becomes an industry industry standard you're just kind of stuck with it you're like oh yeah yeah board game geek so yeah, BGG has been around for a long time and one of many different sources. I, I think we did a while back, we did Reddit. Reddit has a whole bunch of different board game threads out there and they're pretty good for keeping the pulse of things. So we might have to jump back to Reddit. But this week, Board Game Geeks, 15th annual uh, Golden Geek Award. So we'll be talking about that in a little bit. That will be our extended feature review. So in that feature review will of course be acquisition disorders and games we've already gotten to the table. So that will be the really kind of big bulk of the episode. But before we go into the actual episode, we wanted to bring you an acquisition disorder update because Anthony and I did an episode not too long ago that was causing a lot of consternation for us. And that was yeah. talk me out of buying or backing dot, dot, dot this game. And, and in this installment of games that we absolutely positively should not back, because they're awesome, and awesomeness costs money, especially on Kickstarter. Uh, this one was Marvel United X-Men. This was a game that we should not be backing, and we had talked about it for the last couple weeks, and by the time this episode comes out, the, you know, I guess we'll have a, you might have a few hours or a few minutes left. It's possible that you would have time to jump in here, and we're not trying to convince you to buy it, even though it's kind of awesome, but we want to help you to, you know deal with the emotional upheaval of this right anthony yeah yeah it, it's we went through this when we did the episode you know yes i we both we both backed the original kickstarter so we're both like we already invested to some degree but uh. the split happens in that the split happens in that you are a huge lifelong x-men fan and i'm just like yeah that 90 show is cool so i you know we're coming from very different perspectives here and i think i've failed in my role in trying to talk you out of this because I got a notification this morning on my phone that said, someone, someone, someone had caved. Don't look at it. me. Don't look <laughs> at me, man. Don't look. Don't, I don't want to. No, no, I can't. Why? No, I don't want to talk about it. No, I guess I, I guess I have to talk about it because the Patreon backers, you know, you know, they want us to talk about it, but yeah. So I, backed honestly the the simon you know marvel united because again so many miniatures and it really wasn't about the gameplay and when i backed it i knew going into the the game that the gameplay was going to be light and light gameplay is not a sin i mean that's great if you can get the game to the table you enjoy it you have family or friends that love to play it if you can get gamers to play it even better awesome all for that but honestly like funko has clearly done a little bit of a dance on my head so i'm like oh cool chibi miniatures of the marvel characters i grew up with i need to back that and again it's it's not a game that i'm gonna bring through game night and then obviously the x-men came up and i'm like oh no like i own all these comics i know all these characters this is not good this is 
this is hardcore mainlining nostalgia. You know, this is just like ice cold, you know? So yeah, I've been watching the campaign and not at all wanting to back this. And then eventually they finally came around and did their all in pledge, which basically is just about 10% off of their final cost. And since there are, again, so many miniatures in the game, and this is like a recent review, I think Movie Clichés was was another little bo small box board game where it was just like, I'm just backing it because of nostalgia. I'm backing it because it's cute and adorable. I'm not expecting much gameplay with it. I mean, if I could get someone to play this, that would be amazing. But I'm not expecting that. This is purely because I like the characters and the amount of money that it would cost to have little figures like this anywhere else would be astronomical i mean the only downside is they're not painted uh so yeah. that's really what one of the things is going to bug me i have to kind of look away and just go oh that looks really cool painted i'm never going to do that but it looks cool painted so yeah they finally broke me as far as the campaign's concerned when they did days of future past and they did three giant sentinels and i was yeah. like oh <laughs> <laughs> You were not messing around. And I figured they were going to do the Sentinels because they're so iconic to X-Men. And here we are. And then, of course, on top of it, they threw Fantastic Four in, which I'm a fan, but not like a huge fan, but I'm a fan. And the miniatures are fantastic. Like, they did a really good job putting those miniatures together on that. Uh, I'm still waiting for my, like, favorite, favorite characters. Like, Shadow Cat just came out with with lockhead and i'm like oh that's really cool that those are like my favorite characters i'm still waiting for nightcrawler which he's definitely going to show up at some point so i'm not too concerned um but yeah I, I have the ones that i like it's it's a lot of like weird characters that no one's gonna ever want to play with you know like oh cool pixies in here and dupe is in here and <laughs> no one's ever gonna want to play those but nonetheless it's a lot of variety i, I think when we've you and I, Anthony, when we talked about board gaming for so many years, it's like, what do you really love about board gaming? For me, it's been interesting decisions. Like, that's been my thing. Like, I love to play a game that has interesting decisions. This does not have that. This has <laughs> an endless number of miniatures that you could play with. So almost like infinite replayability. So right. this is the other side of that. So, and again... I've seriously thought about selling my Marvel United because those characters, why I like them, they're not the X-Men characters for me. But again, I think if I did that and I wanted to play this, you as the general gamer might say, no, I really don't want to play Feral or Polaris or Strong Guy or Boom Boom. I want to play Captain America. Isn't Captain America a Marvel guy? Or, you know, like, I'm like, yeah, all right. And then at that point, as long as I could bring those kind of characters into the gameplay, you'll feel happy, I'll feel happy, and we'll all have a good time together. So, yeah, I, I you know, again, this is going to be like one of those super chunks of money that I will regret as time goes on. But the number of miniatures are so cool, and the detail looks so great. And it's, you know, the Marvel United, even though it has, they haven't given people time to play it, and I think that's purposeful because they don't want you to know that it's not that kind of game. <laughs> I, I think that it's, again, if you are a collector, if you are interested in nostalgia and this is your thing, this is, you know, my thing. I mean, I, the, the only other thing they could do would be like Star Wars, you know, Star oh. Wars United. Oh, God. You know, that would it. be dangerous. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do it. It's just like, don't do that and uh, stay away from that or... Yeah. yeah i, I that, that that's about it yeah so again if you have time and you want to back it go ahead i i can't speak to it i can't say anything bad about it I've, I've lost all credibility as far as that's concerned but again um a piece of our childhood we get to play with and that's that's awesome so if you get it yeah. enjoy it uh we'll talk about it when i finally get my kickstarter thing which will probably be two or three years from now because that's how simon does these things but yeah, you know, again, it is what it is. Uh, Anthony, will you be backing this? You know, I I, I mock uh, greatly, but those Fantastic Four, I really, I just want that. If I'm being <laughs> honest, yeah. And I'm not even sure I can just get that. All like, right. I feel like I need to. I don't. I don't know if you can just back that. But then, if I'm going to back that, I might as well pay the sixty dollars 
and get like the base version with like the 500 miniatures that come with that, right? Yeah. Um, that would definitely be where I stop is like those two, but that's still a hundred dollars. Sure. So I'm I'm still very much on the fence with that because hundred bucks yeah. additional on a game that I've already spent two fifty on. I'm like, eh, eh. And my kids don't know anything about the X Men, so they don't care right now. They will eventually, but right now they don't care. So I don't know. I'm I'm on the fence still. I got a couple days. <laughs> yeah, the sixty five dollar pledge, the mutant pledge, gets you. I think the vast majority of the stretch goals of miniatures. So yeah. just for the $65, you're getting your miniatures worth period. So you're getting things, you know, as far as the box is concerned, you're getting weapon X, you're getting X 23, you're getting Kitty pride, uh, lockhead Gwenpool. If, if that's important to you, a bunch of the anti heroes like Neymar Legion, you probably know Emma Frost, you might know, um, and a bunch of uh, really like really cool villains. So I think that the $65 pledge is great. Um, and then also they threw in the X-Force expansion to that. So again, that's just more content, free content. So cables in there. So that might be something that you want because again, it this, this the $65 stretch limit is really cool. The $100 one, you get Apocalypse and his whole little thing I don't know if that matters much to anyone but me because I literally have these specific yeah. comic books. So you might want to pass on that one. Again, the only th reason you may not want to, again, and they know this, is they added Storm in the with her mohawk. Again, I have the comic with her having the mohawk. You may not care because you're getting Storm in other places, possibly, in this set. So again, that's not a thing. You could, like you said, Anthony, you could just jump and either get the base set and Fantastic Four or just get Fantastic Four. I mean, you do have the Marvel United. So right. I don't know if you yeah, yeah. I don't know if you you know you want to do that, but you could just back that or let me know and I'll get you a copy of the the one. Again, like I said, the only one that I, I think just really puts this set over the line is the giant sentinels. And they're like three times bigger than the actual characters. I know. So everything else is like Ah, cool. You did Deadpool. That's awesome. Don't need it, but that's cool. Oh, you did Blue Team, Gold Team. Really don't need it. You did First Class. Nah. You did Phoenix 5. Nah. But yeah, the Sentinels thing was very cool. The Fantastic Four is amazing. You get Doctor Doom. I mean, you got Doctor Doom. He's like mm -hmm. one of the best villains of all time. And the miniatures right. are really cool for that. So yeah, I would, me I would recommend the Fantastic Four set. Because also, that's another set that everyone knows the Fantastic Four. It's not like some random, like, oh, here's Mr. Sinister. Like, who the heck knows about Mr. Sinister except for me? Right. <laughs> so, but if you do know who Mr. Sinister is and you want to play, let me know and hit me up. But otherwise, Days of Future Past, I think, is worth your time and money. Fantastic Four is worth it. And then the base set is worth it. And I, I, that's as far as I could honestly recommend unless you have the same comic book collection i have that's really it <laughs> you know i just yeah 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 so but uh yeah that's that's our wrap up from our episode 322 listen back to that one because we're going to do a lot more of these talk me out of buying and backing whatever that particular game is i think it's a really fun feature uh, we've gotten a lot of really good you know feedback on it so please hit us up let us know what upcoming campaign you would like to talk be talked out of because it's just so awesome so uh yeah that's that's our little update as far as that's concerned but anthony that's not all obviously that's what's going on with bga but let's talk about what's going on with our listeners and our viewers what's our question of the week all right yeah so uh this is kind of a follow-up to uh the question one of the questions we did last week and uh i'm not I tend to shy away from these questions of like, what's a really hot game that you hate? <laughs> uh, but I also know we get a lot of good answers. So anybody sure. who actually answered that question and gave us a good why they hate it, I read it out. So nice. same rule here. What's a game that kind of everybody passed on, uh, mm -hmm. you know, or dragged or ignored or whatever that you love. But of course you got to tell me why. I, if you just say the name of a game, I'm not going to read it out because that doesn't <laughs> add anything to the show. We need a sure. reason why. Uh, so let's run through a few of these that are fun. We've got Andre mentions, uh, he says, I think Feudum for its fiddliness was a big problem for his group. Um, it has issues, but for him, he, he's very immersed in the world and enjoys the gameplay. 
action selection and the great puzzle still excite him. Um, he also mm-hmm. mentions Pipeline as another game that uh, he really thought would be big and just didn't click for anybody else. But he really enjoys it as a deep economic game that's like brain burning in a good way. Um, I still have not played my copy of Feudum three years later. Oh, but Pipeline, I can I can get behind that one. I did not play that forever, but I, when we finally got it to the table, um, really enjoyed it quite a bit. I love Feudum. I'm like I'm probably the biggest. There's like Marvel X Men, and then there's Feudum. I like I I love you though. I I that's a, again that's another one of those games that y- you're you got to be in the zone for that game and I and I advocate for that game all the time. But it is one of those games that you really do need a strong advocate because it's trippy, man. It's a really it's a trippy game and there's a lot to it. So I, I completely understand why people are like a little you know sheepish on it. Yeah, yeah. No, it makes sense. It's it's a mm-hmm. big barrier to entry. Yeah. Um, all right, Stephanie says, uh, my husband and I both love Pioneer Days, uh, but I really see anyone mention it. They love the theme, decision-making, and trying to prepare for disasters while recruiting people to join your group. Um, I played Pioneer Days. I actually, I did enjoy it quite a bit, but it just also didn't click for my groups that I could bring it to. Um, mm-hmm. it, like that whole Tableau system, it was really, really fun. Uh, and I ended up passing it on. But I, I do hear that. I think I gave it a, a play here on the podcast because I did enjoy it quite mm. a bit. Um, she also mentions Rajas of the Ganges as her favorite board game and, you know, knows there's people who love it, but it just didn't get as much buzz as it should. So uh, I, I think that one might be a little more buzzy in certain circles than others. It's not like a big crossover Euro hit, but a lot of people I know really love that game. Gotcha. Yeah, uh, I agree. Go ahead. Please. Several different people mentioned Tapestry. So uh, we'll read one of them here. AC says, Tapestry got a real bad rap, and I think it's mainly because of mishandled expectations. I do not necessarily adore the game, but I do really like it and enjoy playing it. I enjoy it because of the high-value production, the subtle interaction, and the choices. Um, Chris also mentions Tapestry. He says he feels he got panned and beaten down because of a not-my-civ game mentality and a lot of concern over the imbalanced factions. Uh, mm-hmm. But specifically, they love it for being a Civ game that plays quickly with great decisions that can affect many at the table, battles that don't take all day to resolve, and wonderful production value. Uh, I don't even necessarily disagree with all those. I, I will disagree a little with the unbalanced factions thing. Like, that really <laughs> bothered me a lot, especially, like, them patching the game after the first month. Mm-hmm. But some games are just imbalanced, and if you're okay with that, you know, go for it. Um, yeah. For, for me, Civilization A New Dawn kind of fits that, where it's like, a lighter, quicker civilization game that feels like a Civ game. Whereas for me, Tapestry didn't quite as much feel like a Civ game, but I could see why it would for some people. Gotcha. Uh, all right. And then one more here we'll do. Uh, Dead Squirrel says, Food Truck Champions. It's a great family weight multi-use card game where you're competing against other food trucks to fulfill customer orders. And Sakura is a super light game where you try to position yourself just right so you score the most points when the empower emperor views a garden. Uh, most people don't seem to care for it, but I really like how light it is and the overall look of the game. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot on here. Like, if you're looking for some good game recommendations, there's a lot of games in here that are definitely not hotness regulars. Uh, if you want to check out the Facebook page and look at the, the thread there. But thanks to everybody yeah. who wrote, wrote in. It's fun to hear what games everybody is like championing. They're like, this is my game and nobody likes it. Nobody will play it. Uh, and why you think it's worth everybody giving it a go. Gotcha. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and again, that's what's great about board gaming is that there's really a lot of uniqueness, a lot of beautiful weirdness out there in gaming. And each of us are advocates for those games. So yeah, please get out there and let everyone know that you love those games and Especially hit us up on our, our social media, Facebook, Twitter. We're pretty much everywhere that you are out there in the digital world. So if you would love to just drop some pictures, drop some information about your favorite games, start a conversation, please, please use our platforms. We're happy to promote board gaming any way possible. And if you'd like, you can let us know so we can get it on the podcast and maybe talk about it in more detail with you. So again, uh, thank you all for, you know, popping in, dropping in, and uh, hopefully we'll get more of that out there. 
our question of the week happens every day, which is our question of the day. So again, Facebook and Twitter is probably the best place to start those conversations. And again, thanks to everyone who submitted. All right, Anthony. So that's what's going on with our listeners. Now on to our feature review. So our feature review this week, again, is the 19th annual Golden Geek Awards winners for 2020. It seems like, like the Emmys or the Oscars, right? Like it's just some, some <laughs> a bit of weirdness, so to speak. But nonetheless, we are talking about these great games that happened in 2020. Obviously, a more challenging year to get games to the table. And right. since you do such a great job with our hotness, if you wouldn't mind, Anthony, if you could take us through the award winners. And okay. obviously, <laughs> no less worthy, they're runner-ups. Absolutely, yes. So if you're not all familiar with the Golden Geek Award process... I'm not. Every year... <laughs> <laughs> every year they send out a blast to everybody about a month before the awards are announced maybe a little before i don't remember exactly when but they'd say we we need nominations so you can go through and nominate whatever for any of these categories right they'll have all the different categories i think there's about 10 12 of them something like that we'll go through all of them sure but you nominate whatever you want and then once the nomination period closes, they'll mm -hmm. put up a list of the nominees. So these are the ones that got the most uh, nominations, right? I think it's five nominations for each category. And then there's about two weeks or so of voting. And you get 400 emails from all the different game companies that you are affiliated with uh, saying, please vote for our game. <laughs> and, and then one day, uh, Scott Alden, he just posts something up on the board game geek homepage not a lot of fanfare not a big award show or anything and they're like ta-da these are the best and despite all that and despite it being on a forum and despite it being like this kind of ramshackle process it is considered one of the premier game awards online right obviously the big big game awards are like the spiel of stars and all those but this is a big one you know and it to some degree it's a popularity contest because it's voted on by the users of golden of board game geek so you do often get games that reflect the hotness of the moment yeah. and of the year. Um, we'll get into a few of those. But it's also a good snapshot. So if you look back at any year's Golden Geek winners, you get a nice little snapshot of what people were playing, what they were really jazzed about. And it's funny because some of those years you look at it and you're like, really? That's what everybody was really hyped about in <laughs> 2013 or whatever? Yeah. Um, so yeah. We're going to we're going to run through all these. There is a winner and two runners up for every category. And um we'll we'll talk through them and what we know of them. We we obviously have not played all of these games cuz these are 2020 releases and sure. You all know our situation for 2020. <laughs> <laughs> we're all in it together. Yes. Uh, but it'll be fun. So, uh two player games. Uh so the best two player game. So there are two runners up here. Uh the first of them unmatched cobble and fog mm -hmm. and so the unmatched series it, it's this is not a standalone game i mean it is a standalone no. game but it's not the first in the series of standalone games it is a series of different games released by mondo games in collaboration with restoration games and i believe it's like re-implementing an old star wars game i can't remember exactly which one it was but it's effectively like a one-on-one -on -one dueling type of game right and so each of these sets comes with different combinations of characters some of them are like super off the wall and this one is uh cobble and fog so it's it comes with four uh heroes you've got sherlock holmes the invisible man uh, jekyll and hyde and dracula so <laughs> just some random oddball stuff from the late 19th century um yeah. and i've heard a lot of good things about it there's i think five six seven of these different sets but this is one that a lot of people are talking about yep uh, other runner-up was Imperial Struggle. This is the long, long-awaited uh, sequel to Twilight Struggle, taking place in the age of Imperial Expansion. So this one shipped like last summer at the worst possible time. So I've not, I still haven't played it. I don't know if like I've heard good things. It is the sequel to Twilight Struggle, the one-time all number one game of all time on Board Game <laughs> Geek. But um, those who have played it have spoken highly. And then the winner of this category was Undaunted North Africa. Uh, this is a sequel of sorts to Undaunted Normandy, which came out the year before. And it is a like scenario-driven deck-building game. 
kind of, where you, you basically face off one-on-one -on -one in this war game where you're building your deck and, and putting out various units. Um, I have not spent a ton of time with this because it kind of became popular in our group at a time right before COVID hit, but sure. um, heard very, very, very good things about it in terms of, you know, as a two-player game. And so the North Africa version seems to be up there as well for everybody. Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't played any of these two-player games. No. <laughs> uh, you know, Imperial Struggle was something I was interested in because Twilight Struggle was was something that just had stood the, state, the test of time. But it was like, oh, maybe this would be better to get because people have not played this version yet. And obviously COVID. Um, Unmatched, I've heard a lot about because there's so many, I, I guess, quasi-expansions or standalone games with different oddball characters it's a little, a little kind of it's it it borders on just being a little too abstract as far as like wacky characters slapping each other around, and I have a number of those games, so right. I've kind of been a little bit back on it, but maybe it's something eventually I will just want to jump in on, and Undaunted, that's just not my game group's like wheelhouse for whatever reason. Right. It's just not not the war game kind of thing. Yeah. I, I... I have people I could play any of these with. It just haven't. So I, I sure. would say maybe at some point I will. I'll talk about them. But at the moment, I've not played any of these either. Gotcha. Um, moving on to in a category where I know we've both played at least two of these. Um, yes. Artwork presentation. So the uh, first runner up here is Calico. This is a a game that kind of blew up on Twitter more than anything. Uh, mm -hmm. not, not too long ago um, with artwork by Beth Sobel about cats. And people love their cat games. So it, mm -hmm. it does have beautiful artwork. Single artist on the game, too, which is always fun because you could see their artwork throughout the game. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's got a nice little simple family abstract type of game about cats. Gotcha. Uh, second runner up there is Lost Ruins of Arnok. This is one of my favorite games from last year. And, you know, at first glance, you look at that cover and you're like, oh, yeah, you know. They're fine in temples and stuff, but like the artwork on the individual cards and the tiles and everything in the game, it's all very, very well done. Uh, sure. The overall presentation here is fantastic. It does have, I think, five artists or maybe six credited on the game. So it's a big group of people who worked on this. And so you can see the different styles, but they're all very solid. Sure. And then the winner, uh, which I'm very happy about because this is what I would have voted for, On Mars from our buddy Eno <laughs> Tool. Uh, honestly, every year, and there is a new Lacerda game almost every year at this point, they should just win. You got Eno Tool doing the artwork, just give it to them. <laughs> every year. <laughs> yeah. Why are we even voting? I, I mean, Lost Ruins of Arnok was not bad. I mean, it really did no. give you that kind of Tomb Raider, Indiana Jones kind of feel, and it's just a nice, generally good graphic design and, and overall artwork for the Calico too with the cats and and again i think the artwork for calico has sold more more copies of calico than the actual right. gameplay which is very just abstract it's not bad it's just it's just very abstract so i think the warmness of the cat on the you know it's just i i think it just does a lot more because i've heard just like random people in the public who are not hardcore board gamers asking about calico because it's been out of prints for so long so I think people do connect with that artwork very strongly, but yeah, on Mars again is an, is Calico should have won, but on Mars is a higher level of complexity, you know, depicting the idea of the travel to Mars and back, like the the sparseness of Mars and the challenge of all that, and you know, too does a, a fantastic job, uh, you know, overall on that. So yeah, that that makes all the sense in the world for sure. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, it's it's a very board game geek kind of a game where like there's a lot of people on here like Lacerda games and I'm one of them. Sure. So I that's what I voted for. <laughs> so Yeah, uh, I mean you can't you can't go wrong, but I, I do think on Mars, like I said, it was a higher level of, of challenge with that. But both both other games are great too. I mean the artwork right. I think and 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 again, even even going back again with just one more time to uh, Lost Ruins of Arnak, that could have been as cheesy as all get out, and it looks great. Yeah. So yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I was like, oh no, this is a really good piece. I would I would happily put that board game box anywhere. It really it's really got that sense of adventure to it. So yep. 
cool yeah love, love it. it yeah absolutely all right next up card game uh first runner up oceans so okay. this is not a game i've played uh i know mm-hmm. it is in the series of um evolution yes uh, mm-hmm. based games it's not like a it's a standalone in that series. So it uses some of the same mechanics and it, it focuses on sea creatures. So yep. I have not started. played it. I've played evolution, but I've heard mm-hmm. good things about this as well. If you like evolution. Yes. Uh, next runner up is Fort. This was for both of us. One of our favorite games of the year. Fantastic card game. Great re-implementation of a relatively difficult to get to the table game because of the theme before. Um, mm-hmm. I, I was... That's the one I voted for personally to win this category. And sure. I, I was sad to see that it didn't quite get there. It almost got there. And I don't even know that I expected it to get fully there, but not quite. And then the winner is Dune Imperium. So Dune Imperium being a deck builder based on Dune um, from the guys who did Clank. And I, I will contend still that Dune Imperium is a, a very solid game. I have not played it with the right groups of people to like give it a rating, but at this point it's sitting at a, a decent play for me. I am still astounded by how popular this game is. It's in the top 100 already. It's in the top 50 of strategy games. People are just devouring this thing. And I think this might be, you know, maybe one of those cases of, you know, BGG hype. I don't know. I haven't played it enough to say so, but I wish Ford had won. That's all I got to say. <laughs> So there's two things I want to say about this. I one I'll go, you know, Paul Dean, um, who you know was the designer behind Clank, came out with this. So there's a lot of Clank in here. So I think I think he's done a great job of implementing a game mechanic that will be used again and again. Now deck building with a board game is not new, and I I won't go into my own thoughts and feelings. I love Dune. Like I. You know, I watched that when it came out in the movie theater. I, I have serious childhood trauma about watching Dune <laughs> as a kid and going, I'm way too young for all this weird weirdness and violence and stuff. But no, Dune is something I know the books. I, I, you know, I will, you know, promote all day long for this. And the Clank games I like, but they're just like, they're okay. You know, they're, you, but I, I think for just like the average audience, there's obviously a lot of love for Dune. Even when Dune came back out, the the original board game, since it wasn't updated by Gale Force 9, people were still like, oh, this is still great. You know, like this was great back in the day, but they should have really upped it. So when this game came out, I think the Dune fans were so thrilled. And I think the Clank fans were happy because this was another, this was a serious version of their mechanic. That being said, yes, I am going to be that guy and say, this is not a card game. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's no. not a card game. Like, I'm not downing the game, but this is not a card game. There is too much board interaction. There is worker placement is one of the main mechanics here. Yes, there's deck building, but there's worker placement here. Come on. Yeah. No, well, the thing no, is, no. If this is a card game, Lost Ruins of Arnak is a card game because it's the same mechanic yes. and that's a better game. <laughs> So give the award yes. to that game then. <laughs> yeah, I don't no, I I'm sorry. Like I know this is an age old, you know, debate what's a card game, what's a board game, because why not? But nope. <laughs> sorry, can't <laughs> I can't can't do it. Nope, nope, nope. I will give you a lot of slack on a lot of things, but that is not a card game. Nobody who looks at that game goes, that's a card game. It's got a card mechanic. It's not a card game, it's a board game, it's got a board got worker placement don't give me that like fort has a little board that just holds the cards it just holds the cards there's no playability on the board you're just putting the stuff on the little tiny boards like this has an actual board that have interactions and like area control like no 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 not a board game that's it (laughs) i've spoken let's 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 move on (laughs) you heard it here first everybody chris Chris is not a fan of card games pretending to be board games pretending to be card games. Um, I'm watching you. Next up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> next up, cooperative game. Uh, so runner up on here, first runner up, Forgotten Waters. This is a game that came out like right at the beginning of the pandemic and seems like it probably got it, a lot of fans out there, but it's three to seven players. And it came out like last June. So I don't know yeah. how anybody got this to the table. 
and yet enough people must have because it's very popular. It's a Crossroads game. It's a new Crossroads game uh, from Flat Hat. So that alone makes it, I would love to check it out, but I have not played it myself. Sure. Uh, runner up number two, Pandemic Legacy Season Zero. So this is the third in the Pandemic Legacy uh, trilogy. This one's not even really about viruses by all accounts, but regardless, I'm not playing a game <laughs> Pandemic Legacy in the middle of a pandemic. So also have not played this. And then the winner of the Cooperative Game of the Year is, of course, something with Gloom and Haven in the title, Jaws of the Lion, which is <laughs> just just a boiled down version of Gloomhaven. And yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> I don't <know. laughs> I, I'm not sure what I think of Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion winning all these awards. We've had this conversation in the Dice Tower Awards group because we both vote on that. And it's up for a lot of awards there too. And I'm just like, ah, it's, it's not the same game, but it's kind of the same game. Like, what are we doing? We already gave all these awards to that game. Let's give it to different games. Let's show people different games. Yeah, I'll agree with that too. Because again... I mean, Gloomhaven deserves its due, but, you know, with the Dice Tower Awards and several other kind of awards committees and things like that, like, when other things have, when other games have done this, like Brass, that's been two versions of the same thing, or there's been plenty of games that had, you know, the small version or the light version or the kids version, and everyone's like, oh, those are cool, but that's, that's not, you know, that's the same game. This is the same game. Yeah. It's a smaller version of it, and that's awesome, and I love it. But no, <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> no, you can't. No, you, no, 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 no. Like, yeah. <laughs> if it, yeah. If, look, look. If Founders of Gloomhaven is not is not being the albatross around Gloomhaven's neck, then Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion can't just you know surf on Gloomhaven's tails. I mean, come on. Come on. No, no, no. Come on. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. It's that's not I mean, the last time we're going to be talking about that game either. So we, we got more time to go on about Gloomhaven. Oh, it's going to uh, get worse. <laughs> yeah. No, there's there's a much worse one coming up. Oh, I know. Um, <laughs> yeah. You've seen the list. All right. So let's jump into the next one. Uh, expansion of the year. Uh, runners up. Either one of these would have been the expansion of the year for me. I'm not a, I don't have a problem with the winner, but the two runners up are amazing. Uh, yes. Spirit Island Jagged Earth, which adds so much content to Spirit Island. So yeah. much, like a full extra box of content. Yeah. Uh, and I've been playing a fair bit of that lately, actually. My, the game group that I finally gotten back out with now that we're all vaccinated, we've been playing Jagged Earth and all the new spirits and the new mechanics on the board. It's amazing. It's so good. And then Root, the Underworld expansion, which came out last January, uh, so very early in the year, and I did get a chance to play it a bunch, where you've got the Corvid Conspiracy and the Duchy, two amazing new factions, um, and a new board, the Underground board, on top of everything else. Just any Root content is winning content for me, but very, very good content there. And then the winner, Wingspan Oceania expansion. The expansions for Wingspan are very good, so I'm not saying that that's not a some of these were like, oh, why did that win? This is not one of those situations. And it makes sense because sure. we're talking about a popular vote here and more people own Wingspan and are enjoying it. Yep. But for me personally, I voted for Root. But but just so you all know what I think. <laughs> yeah, and I voted for, you know, uh, I mean, obviously it's, it's not, not too shocking as far as this is concerned, but Jagged Earth, like you said, it added a lot more to the game. Um, I, the only reason, well, I mean, again, it deserves it on its own wingspan oceana expansion but since they they were raising money for the massive fires you know i mean mm -hmm. maybe that kind of pushes it over because i mean as a yeah. game it's it's not bad i mean obviously there are certainly things that a are added to the game and again not not you know revolutionary but yeah i think as you mentioned the, you know wingspan has been such a phenomenon that just like Gloomhaven, it's not surprising that it, it would just it you know the wave would just continue to carry it. But yeah, I if you own any of these three games, get the expansions. You're not going to be disappointed. Yeah, that is the one thing I'll say is the nominations for that category spot on. So good job, yeah, everybody. Who did nominations there. These these three are perfect. Yeah, all great. All right. All right, next up, we've got Innovative Game of the Year. Uh, so runner-up number one, Beyond the Sun. I reviewed this mm -hmm. back in December, gave it a buy. It's amazing. 
Uh, I don't, I guess the innovation here is that the whole game is the tech tree, <laughs> which, mm -hmm. you know, everybody loves their tech trees in a 4X game. In this game, it's just the one, there's two axes. You are exploring a sure. little, but mostly you're just building out your technologies, which is the most fun part of the game. It's on board mm -hmm. game arena too. So if you want to check it out, that's the place to do it. I think it's in beta right now. Yeah. Um, other runner up the search for planet X. This is a deduction game. I have not had a chance to play it myself, but it's designed by Matthew O'Malley and Ben Rossett, um, who did Between Two Cities, which is one of my favorite games for sure. larger groups of people. Uh, so um, that's that's a game worth checking out, I guess, if you're a big fan of deduction games. And then Micro Macro Crime City, which is a game you actually sent me th saying, you're like, you might be interested in this. And then I just never got around to checking it out. So I know it's like a murder mystery type of deduction game, but in a very unique type of way in terms of like the maps and like all these big massive like isometric uh black and white drawings right yeah it's it's where was waldo with murder <laughs> nice. it's just like you know if like oh if you you know got bored of where's waldo or you got really annoyed about trying to find him and you just up and murdered him that would be this game i mean <laughs> oh. it it deserves to be here it deserves the award for sure uh, again, it's one of those games that's almost like a one and done kind of situation because once you do mm. spot where those places are, you really can't go back and not know exactly where those those kind of things, those mysteries lie. But again, yeah, pretty cool. Again, it's always like these are these these are the games that I always kick myself and I'm go, of course that could have been a board game. Why didn't I do that? <laughs> right. <laughs> like where's Waldo? Like why? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, bingo! Yeah. I can make that into a board game. Ah, they already did that. Yeah. So. <laughs> yep all right so uh light game of the year so we've we've got light medium and heavy coming up here so first up yes. light runners up we got santa monica uh this is a like artistically just a very clean fun light uh presentation it's kind of a very light city building type of game with the, the cards that you lay out I'm trying to build mm -hmm. the, the like the, the tableau for the pier the santa monica pier um we have Project L, which is a game that I need to try because it is like, by all accounts, the ultimate polyomino game, <laughs> like yes. where you're physically building all these things. I need to check it out. Uh, this was on Kickstarter, and mm -hmm. I think they re-released it sometime last year. Yeah. And then the winner, Micro Macro Crime City, which we just talked about. So there you go. <laughs> here, here I'm gonna I'm gonna go against the grain a little bit here because I don't think that I don't think that it deserved to be the light game of the year. I, I think it's, okay. you know, it's like a lot of those kid games, like Spot It, like, cool, I'm down with that, but Project L or Santa Monica, you know, their games. Micro, right. Macro Crime City is kind of more of a game experience than a game, right? Because if you just randomly see it on the board, you're like, oh, cool, I found the thing. But Project L is a deck builder, like you said, with Polyomino and Santa Monica is a light you know, like you said, city building games. So I just don't think that it, I just think that we need to accept the fact that some games should be here, but they should be game experiences instead of like a, like a, a system or a mechanic, you know, spot right. something on a complicated piece of paper is not really game, game, game. It's still great. You know, I, I still want to own a copy myself, but game, game, uh, I don't know. I feel bad. I mean, Project L, they threw a lot of work into it, even Santa Monica. But yeah, Project L, I don't know. It's pretty innovative. I almost backed it, but yeah. All right. Uh, next up, we've got the medium game of the year. So mm -hmm. uh, this one, we have some... So first up, the first runner-up is Calico, which I don't know that I would categorize this as a medium game. But again, we're talking about board game geek here. Where it's, it's all the different users of the site voting, and we tend to skew on the heavier side. So we we, we tend to think things are medium when they're a little bit heavier. So to sure. be fair, we're a little biased in that way. Um, Calico's probably a medium game. Runner up number two, Dune Imperium. So uh, again, we talked about this before, kind of the, mm -hmm. the deck building board game spin on on the Clank formula, and then the winner, Lost Ruins of Arnak. So the the right worker placement deck building game one out here so i'm happy with that yeah i, I agree 100 no problems with this at all i think it's i think it's a medium weight game 
I, I think it's a board game board game, and I think it has a lot a lot to offer. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, not a lot to talk about there. We've talked about all three of these games already. Next up, heavy game of the year. This is like our jam. This is the category that we're all about, right, uh, on this podcast. So runner-up number one is Viscounts of the West Kingdom. So this is the newest West Kingdom game, the third in the trilogy uh, from Shem Phillips. Uh, it's fine. I played it. It's all right. I, it's not. It's not an eight point one for me personally. The rating on the on the site here. So I know a lot of people dig those games, but I like Paladins better, um, theme notwithstanding. Runner up number two on Mars, which was the game that I personally voted for. Uh, loved on Mars. I also would have taken. A lot of the other games listed here on the nominees list. Uh, 18 Chesapeake was really good. Hallertau was good. Kanban EV was amazing. Uh, Praga Kaput Regni was very good. But the winner of this category uh, for Heavy Game of the Year is Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. So I'm kind of complaining about this earlier. Again, Gloomhaven, yes. Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, lighter version of the game to sell it to more people at Target. I don't, I know a lot of people love it. I think it's great too, but I just, I wish, you know, more more diversity in the awards. And yeah, I don't know. I wasn't thrilled with that one. So look, Board Game Geek, when they talk about weight, weight means complexity, right? So there's a lot of different rationale on why something could be heavy or complex. And again, we can, that, I think we've done somewhat episodes on that. I think we at least did one episode on, on weights of games. So again, we could right. come, come back around to that again, but board game geek uses a five point weight scale, light, medium, light, medium, medium, heavy and heavy. Do I always agree with the point system? Not at all. But again, it's one of those situations where you do have to ask yourself as far as games are concerned, where does something fit in? So, you know, vice council of the West kingdom is listed as a 3.45. So again, if you go by the complexity rating here, that should be, you know, medium to medium heavy. So it's not really a heavy game. I don't think any heavy gamer would say like, oh, let's bring that game out. Like, I mean, it's just, it's just, it doesn't resonate with Board Game Geek's ratings as it is. And I think that's just, it's kind of ridiculous. And then the same thing with Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion, a 3.57 like this is a game they sell in target i'm sorry like um gloomhaven is a wondrous system it's a complex system i get that there's going to be challenges with this but like unless you are new to board gaming there's no way that jaws of the lion is you know a 3.57 i i just i just can't i i wish i could go along with that and just be like oh yeah that's definitely a heavy game like no one's ever said that but that sentence has never occurred. And in fact, Loomhaven itself gets a 3.86 as far as weight's concerned. So, you know, again, it's it's not necessarily a heavy game. And I, and I think they do the category of disservice by having games in there that are not heavy. Now, in comparison, on Mars, rated by Board Game Geek, the weight is a 4.64. So you have a, ga- you have a game that's a whole weight higher a whole one point something higher than the other two so how are the other two in this category as heavy i mean gloomhaven draws a lion that could be a medium weight game and so vice council of the west kingdom that's a medium game like i don't how is that heavy when one of the when one of the other games is a whole one point higher like it does just doesn't do it just i can't i, I mean i can't rationalize it i'm sorry like <laughs> it's one point something yeah. heavier man like it's you it's it's a legitimate he- on mars is a legitimately heavy game it's not an e- oh, don't yeah. tell me you, yeah you put on mars on the table and you put vice counts or you put gloomhaven jaws of the lion and you bring in the general public in they're gonna play gloomhaven without a problem it's it's you know they'll get into it and same thing with vice counts like that's a, a somewhat gateway to a little bit heavier game but on mars even the heaviest gamers are going to like scratch their head, you know, trying to play that game. It's a yeah. Lacerda. I mean, it's legitimate Lacerda. I don't know. 
Yeah. It's not <laughs> just, just Lacerda. It's like Lacerda's heaviest game. So it is. It's like the most Lacerda of Lacerdas. But what really bothers me is that even Board Game Geek rates it so much heavier and the other two don't. And that's just, again, that's just what throws me a little bit because even if you, you know, you look at the other games there, it just, I don't know. I, I just, it's just weird. Like, why not throw in Beyond the Sun? Beyond the Sun is a relatively heavy game. I mean, that's something that would fit, you know? I mean, it's, uh, uh, and even that's somewhat light as far as just being a one-trick pony, but all right. Yeah. You know. Yeah, Beyond the Sun was in the medium weight category, too, like. I don't know. Yeah, it, it is a weird one. Uh, I think it's like this kind of voting. Anytime the fans vote, it's a popularity contest. Obviously, sure, when sure. it goes online, a lot more people played. Uh, on yeah. Mars, not as many people play because it is so heavy, right? So yeah, and that's not a bad thing. I just if you're going to make a category for it, then put the games in there that fit that weight class. Like it should be a four point oh to a five. That's all I'm saying. Like if you want to put an extra category, like why not do why not do your rating scale? Do one, two, three, four, five have five categories, right? Cause it's your weight. It's your, right. it's your, it's your thing. Do it. Do instead of doing three, do five. That's all I'm saying. Right. Like, you know, yeah. 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 <laughs> I feel bad. No, I all feel right. bad because it's just, it's not, it's not fair to Lacerda. Sure. I yeah. I mean, it's, I don't, yeah, I agree. I fully agree. Uh, it's, you know, at least Calico, it wasn't, you know, in that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, print and play games. Um, sure. Runner number one, Ticket to Ride, Stay at Home. So this was like a fun, cute. cute. Uh, and you probably saw a lot of these last year that kind of mm-hmm. popped out of the major game companies, like all the Asmodee companies especially. They released little print and play or uh, mm-hmm. expansion type things for their own games. Ticket to Ride, Stay at Home was one of them. So it was like a basically running around your own home <laughs> as a map. Um Rolling Realms was one that uh, Jamie Stegmeyer put together early, early on, like last mm-hmm. May. Uh, in the, I don't know if he was bored or just trying to do something. I think he was trying to do something nice and helpful for the community, but also maybe just he's also stuck at home like the rest of us. Sure. Uh, so that was a roll and write game that basically used all of the games from Stonemeyer Games as mechanics, which was kind of fun. And then the winner in this was Seven Wonders Duel Solo, the official solo mode for this. And there have been other solo versions of Seven Wonders Duel, but this was like the official one from Antoine Bowser and Bruno Cathala. It's very good. Um, the original one was kind of a weird bot. This one has like special cards you print out and, and different mechanics. Uh, very, very solid. And I had a lot of fun with this one. Um, I do wish that we would have seen more like of the runners up and the winners here, maybe some more of like the the indie stuff. Like these are all mm-hmm. three from major companies. We get other games that are nominated like Black Box or Bomber Boys or Roland Cook, Rollway Station. So some of these are really interesting, um, but they don't have like the name recognition. So they're not going to jump up quite as high, but definitely check out that list if you're looking for good mm-hmm. print and play stuff. A lot of good games there. Yeah, and the Seven Wonders Duel uh, solo mode, someone made actually a kind of quick and easy, but I mean, not easy because I would not know how to do it made a web app right. version of that so if you don't want to print it out you can play it straight up and again this is what a it's a wonderful gift to the industry that, that these designers made these things so um it's well appreciated and i love seven wonders duel so this is kind of a given but um bravo to everyone there i mean really great job i mean i mean i i mean they all i i think this is like one of the categories that almost every i mean literally everyone always just needs to win there needs to be no runner-ups like everyone just needs to win because you are giving out free content to play, especially during a pandemic. Like everyone needs to be a winner here. So, you know, bravo to everybody there. Really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. So winner for, for solo game of the year, mm-hmm. uh, runner up number one, Lost Ruins of Arnak. This sure. is an amazing solo game. I've played it maybe a dozen times solo and once sure two player and now a couple of times on board game arena with three or four players uh just a really solid solo plays very smoothly don't have to change a lot of the rules love it uh runner up number two is gloomhaven jaws of the lion (laughs) it's back um this one makes sense for me i don't have a problem with this so much but because gloomhaven for me is a solo game in my head i know a lot of people play with groups but i've always played it solo and this is a great way to do it uh 
And then the winner of the solo game of the year is a big, meaty, expansive, only solo game. And I feel like it kind of had to win Under Falling Skies, uh, which I have kind of touched at the edges of. But I know you've played it more than me because you actually reviewed it. So I did. Uh, and, and you liked it quite a bit, which is surprising to me. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, it, it does have some nostalgia as far as like it is old school galica and space invaders and it has that kind of like 8-bit 16-bit video game kind of mentality to it where you're fighting the alien invaders and they're kind of marching down at you so and it's it's a fairly um simple mechanic to go through there isn't a lot of like story story mode to it but it, it still packs a lot for the box so yeah i think this is this is a perfect winner uh, just because it is a solid solo game. So again, I agree with you. I think Gloomhaven is a solo game more than people would like to say. And Lost Ruins of Arnak have done a wonderful solo version here. But again, I'd like to see, again, I don't know how many solo games came out during 2020, but I think this would be a nice just to give it to the runner-ups to be solo games, not games with a solo component or games you can play solo. Just because I think those games don't them, get though. the credit. Yeah. There just there aren't that many like purely solo games. That's why Under Falling Skies is such a weird game because it's just it's, it's just a solo. lot of game in a box and it's only solo. Yeah, it doesn't yep. happen very often. And it came out the perfect time. So. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, the, the only time it could have came out better if there was literally aliens falling from the sky attacking us. But let's not. <laughs> let's hope it, yeah, yeah. it's never needed. But if it is, yeah. I know how to roll dice to roll them back. I'm just saying. Yes. Yeah. No. CGE nailed it on the solo games this year. Nice um, job. Great job, CGE. All right. So the next category is thematic game. So runner-up number one, Dune Imperium. Uh, a lot of people thought that really captured the Dune theme well. Uh, runner-up number two, On Mars. Uh, it's a Lacerda game. It's always going to be up there for thematic because yes. that dude knows how to put a theme into a Euro game. Right? You want to tell me Euro games aren't thematic? Play a Lacerda. Period, True. Right? Uh, and then the winner, Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion. So, killing it again. There were a lot of other good games I just want to mention that were on the nominations list that I would have loved to see up here as well. So, uh, you had Cosmic Frog, which is a really ridiculous game that I've never had a chance to play, but the theme in there is very well integrated. Uh, Dwellings of Eldervale, Etherfields, Forgotten Waters, um, even Marvel United, you know, which is kind of a silly one, but obviously there's a lot of theme in it. So, uh, Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, obviously, that's des it's designed as a thematic game. It's a dungeon crawly type of thing. So I can't argue with that. But, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's the popular kid. Sounds good. All right. War Game of 2020. Runner up number one, Versailles 1919. Uh, runner up number two, Undaunted North Africa, which won for the two player games. And then. The winner, the overall winner, which I find interesting because this was not the winner uh, before for the two-player games, is Imperial Struggle. Uh, so considered by the community as the best war game, whereas Undaunted North Africa is the best two-player game, both of them being war games. So kind of jostling back and forth on both of those there. Uh, but yeah, the, those right there. Again, I have not played any of these myself personally, and I hadn't played any of the other war games listed. War games are big and long and they're difficult to get. Like, I can't play this with my family. So I just, they didn't get played this year. Gotcha. All right. Uh, next up is Zoomable Game. So this is uh, a special category brought in for this year, presumably. I don't know if we'll see it next year, but games you can play over the computer, uh, not in person, right? So runner up number one is The Search for Planet X, which we talked about earlier as an innovative game. Um, Runner-up number two is My City. This is the legacy city-building game from uh, Renner Knizia. And then winner of this category, and maybe this is why this game blew up so much, we were just talking about why is this game so popular in 2020 of all years, was Forgotten Waters. So this was, again, the new Crossroads game from Plat Hat Games that has jumped up in the ratings. A lot of people are really buzzing about it, despite coming out in June of 2020. So... That is interesting. I, I didn't get a chance to do that, but I would have liked to see how that worked. I really, I mean, I, 
the zoomable game is kind of hilarious. I don't hate it. I love the idea that at least either the zoomable game will be a thing that we will do from now on because everyone has accommodated that kind of, you know, gaming structure. You and I, even Anthony, we did a whole episode on how to do that. So mm -hmm. that's something that certainly you, you can get games to the table depending on what type of game. There's a little thought that has to go into it. You just can't throw any game on the table. You certainly have to think about a number of the different mechanics that goes into making a game somewhat zoomable. But we could leave that category. But I also like just generally the idea that there could be a random category every year to kind of capture the zeitgeist a little bit. You right. know, like, hey, this is a thing yeah, yeah. now. I'm like, oh, okay, let's do a category for it. So, yeah, I think it's it's weird and funny. I don't know if Forgotten Waters is really the best one for that, but I think you mentioned earlier, how do even people get this to the table? Maybe that's the way they got to the table. It must be. Like, three to seven players? How are you doing that in the height of lockdown? I don't know. Uh, sure. All right, so two more categories left. Uh, second to last here, best podcast. So we've got runners up. Obviously, we're the best podcast, but... <laughs> According to Board Game Geek Awards, we've got runners up of Board Game Barrage and This Game is Broken, both amazing podcasts. If you haven't had some of those. And then the winner, uh, which I've heard a lot of buzz about and have mm -hmm. listened to a little bit myself from clips people have sent me, is So Very Wrong About Games. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, three great podcasts, So Very Wrong About Games. I listen to them as well. And they do a lot of heavy games like we do. So we're so glad and um, to our colleagues, to our friends out there putting out podcasts, especially in a time when podcasts are very hard to get to your podcast player, and especially during a time where podcasts are terribly, horribly overshadowed by YouTube and Twitch and literally every other medium these days. So to do a podcast is not an easy thing because you are speaking out to the void. There's no running chat and there's no like numbers as far as who's watching who's contributing who's commenting and stuff like that so um three great podcasts uh you know and again thanks to our colleagues and congratulations to all of them absolutely yeah no it, it's so cool to see all these people and the you know some of these people we know personally and have spent time with and just see them you know getting called out and, and jumping up here it's really cool yeah uh, and again all right thanks to everyone who nominated us too we remain anonymous and for good reason. Yes. <laughs> but thank you all for, uh, you know, uh, voting for us. We do appreciate it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. And then the final award uh, for on the list here was best board game app. So runners up include Cartographers, which I had a blast with this app. I played it a bunch. Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorite roll and writes, or I guess flip and write games. And the app was perfect for exactly what I wanted there. Uh, Second runner-up is Wingspan, which mm -hmm. was a beautiful implementation, both on Steam and even on the Nintendo Switch. <laughs> they sent us a code for that at some point, and it, it ran really smoothly. It was fun to see Wingspan up on the big screen TV. And then the winner, which I 100% agree with, and this is what I voted for, is Root. So Root, uh, my number two game of all time, but also one just hands down one of the best board game apps out there uh, if you're looking for just a great digital board game experience yeah this was a really hard one I, I know that we gave our awards out not too long ago and this was the most challenging of the categories of anything this year because as you mentioned so many reasons root is such a fantastic implementation and a shockingly good one just shockingly how just honestly how good it is and wingspan too like wingspan is an amazing implementation and again it had no reason to be that good. I mean, again, both of them are just like, like Wingspan could have done just a plain board game version of it and it would everyone would have loved it. But they went like above and beyond. The, the, the cards, the birds, when they come out, they, they make their particular, you know, song or sound or whatever. You could play it as a regular board game version, which I appreciate so much because sometimes I don't want all the fancy extraness of it. And especially since it it has ai in it which a lot of board game apps don't typically have ai or have good ai this ai will beat you so yeah i mean this was really a great year for apps and you can't say that every year or at all so yeah if you spent your year playing wingspan online and playing root online you were you were a happy person 
Yeah, absolutely. And it was a perfect time for all these games to come out. And there's a bunch of stuff in the pipeline for 2021. So if you're a digital board game fan, it is a good time. Very much so. So, and uh, again, thanks for everyone for voting on Board Game Geek. It's so great to have your interaction in the hobby and the industry, letting people know what you're getting to the table, what you love to play, and that matters so much to us. So that's why we covered it again this year, because it's just a lot of fun to talk about. Hopefully your winners won, and hopefully those games will get to the table a lot more, you know, coming in 2021. So um, we hope that you enjoyed the podcast this week. Again, if you did not or are interested in listening to us on youtube now the podcast is recorded live no edits required we're out there on youtube on friday so you'll listen to us on wednesday or you listen to us on friday thank you so much for subscribing on youtube that makes a big difference from us and again we are slowly becoming less anonymous so please help us out share the podcast and get great games to the table all right anthony until next time this is chris and this is Anthony. And we'll save you all a seat at the table. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. <laughs>